Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sarita Nair, and I am a managing director at the World Economic Forum. It is my pleasure to welcome all our distinguished participants and excellencies to the first ever World Economic Forum on India. Today, conversations on the state of the global economy are characterized by ongoing and intense anxiety about the dramatic consequences of issues like economic recession, spiraling debt and inflation, rising youth unemployment, fiscal cliffs, and rising income disparity. While India is not isolated from these global dynamics, it is one of the world's most promising economies. It's energetic, it's dynamic, it's entrepreneurial, resourceful, and incredible. Like many other G20 economies, India finds itself before the double yoke of tackling critical national challenges while simultaneously taking on a greater global role in coordinating international responses to the greatest financial crisis in the history and its related impact in terms of political, economic, and social consequences. It is in this context of complexity, interdependency, and hyperconnectivity that this year's World Economic Forum on India aims to catalyze deliberate transformation, one where India's leadership role is undoubtedly extremely important. And therefore, we need to not only reboot India, but also the global economy. The world needs a resilient India characterized by high economic growth, reduced inequality, greater regional trade and cooperation, and increased highly skilled human capital. The World Economic Forum on India is pleased to welcome over 700 leaders, distinguished leaders from 45 countries across policymakers, business leaders, civil society, to help jumpstart spirited discussions and debates on how to achieve rapid, inclusive, and meaningful transformations. So we look forward to the insights of the illustri illustrious panel here on the stage with us today, as well as on your contributions over the next couple of days. I am pleased to hand over now to the chair of the panel, Shekhar Gupta, who I think needs no introduction. He's editor-in-chief of the Indian Express, and he's also a member of the Global Agenda Council at the World Economic Forum. Thank you. Thank you, Sarita. Uh, good morning, all of you. I think it's the, uh, this World Economic Forum also marks the uh, coming out party for Gurgaon. Uh, and I say that as, uh, as a domicile of the state. I mean, sometimes you can be proud of it. Most times you are embarrassed to call yourself a Haryanvi because you can be the butt of many jokes uh, in our country. Uh, but all, brave of all of you to also arrive here in spite of the potholes and the toll plaza and the cops and bad directions. Now, rebooting India. Uh, frankly, uh, over the past many years, some of us, uh, even intellectually, had lost our way a little bit. And we never thought we were all so carried away by growth, 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 and everything going right and getting better, that we didn't quite think that there will be a time very soon when there'll be a session at World Economic Forum called Rebooting India. So in fact, some of us, I would say, were not even mentally prepared to deal with something like this, because all the arguments you have, all the ideas, all the lines you've rehearsed over these many years were growth, 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 and how to do something better, not about rebooting India, but uh, trust uh, us Indians, and trust any democracy to lose its way, <laughs> as we have done over the past, I would say, three years. Uh, and I say that. Uh, uh, mindful of the presence of a senior minister of this cabinet uh, in our midst, that UPA 2, the second UPA government, uh, in my writings, I say it's a victim of an autoimmune disease. 
And it's an autoimmune disease that works between the party and the government. And autoimmune disease is when the body starts eating itself. There are some signs that it's begun to correct itself now. It's begun to take corrective uh, measure. And that, in a sense, is what it would take to reboot India. Because in India had lost its way. India is trying to find its way back. It's lost its way now for three and a half years. It's got to find its way back in one and a half, or in fact, less than one and a half before the next election begins. So, uh, if you so wish, I can, I can give you a one and a half hour speech, but you haven't come to listen to me for one and a half hours. You've got a brilliant panel. You have Chandra. And I will not, uh, I don't have to uh, introduce each one of them in detail. None of you got invited to this hall because you don't know people like these. Uh, so, Chandra, who all, all of you know, has kept the flag of Indian tech industry aloft. I, I don't understand business very well, uh, and I don't buy or sell shares. I'm not allowed to, as per my code of ethics. But when I watch the blue channels in the morning, blue as in business channels, I find, uh, <laughs> I, I, I find, I find Chandra's also like company. Obama's victory. Yes, blue. I find, I find Chandra, Chandra's company always bucking the trend. The trend in tech industry seems to be sort of uh, downwards right now. So you have him. Uh, you have Paul Bolke, who runs Nestle in India, and I was just telling him, why are you here? Because, you know, FMCG and food industry is doing so brilliantly. They are the least affected by <clears throat> downturn and, frankly, not so negatively affected by all the mess that's taken place on uh, policy so far. But he also says that the opportunity in India is much, much bigger. And uh, he's not been discouraged uh, by the bad news in India so far, and they are investing more. Uh, Mr. Ashwini Kumar? Our new law minister, he's a veteran of many ministries, including industry. He knows the picture very well. Uh, he's a reformer. I, I would not dare to call him free marketeer or, you know, he's law minister. If I don't want one more libel suit against me. I don't think anybody from the Congress wants to be called free marketeer. Well, he might lose a job. <laughs> if you say that publicly, he's a oh, free I marketeer. or he? He. You, I nobody see. can sack me. <laughs> <laughs> Trust Rahul to get me sacked. Anyway, he's been trying. Uh, so, so he's now... Uh, and why is the law minister the key minister in India right now? Because what happens uh, in a democracy is, uh, particularly a democracy like India, actually all democracies have a, a balance of power and distribution of power amongst various institutions. Uh, now, no system likes any vacuum. So if one institution weakens, others sort of move in. In India, over the past three years, the executive has weakened dangerously. Uh, we had an article in our paper, I think two weeks back, by a wonderful scholar, Pratap Bhanu Mehta, at Center for Policy Research, in fact, an, uh, a Harvard alumnus, uh, who said that the problem uh, in India is that the state, the executive, has weakened many institutions. And that's why the civil society movements and others are walking in. I have a slightly different spin on it. I sent him a congratulatory message, a wonderful article. But my spin is that executive has not weakened the institutions. The executive has become really weakened. So others are moving in and acquiring exaggerated power. So we have a situation, and I say it in uh, Ashwini's presence, when the Supreme Court decides whether you can go to a tiger sanctuary or not go to a tiger sanctuary. Then you go back to the Supreme Court and say it's not possible to enforce this. Okay, you can go to 20% of the tiger sanctuary. And we'll define the core. I'm, my, my counter question to that, and I have to be careful saying the, these things because only yesterday I survived a contempt of court uh, notice. Uh, in the Supreme Court. Uh, my counter question to that is, you can tell the tourists to go to only 20% of tiger sanctuaries. Can you tell the tigers? Uh, or, or can you have tigers fitted with GPSs, maybe? But can you get the tigers to read GPSs? Uh, so what's happening is because the executive has become very weak, other institutions are moving into that space. And one of those is the judiciary, which is doing wonderful work but which is also causing strains uh, in our governance because of this imbalance. So he's somebody who was appointed just last week to fix this in the next three months. Uh, Gita Gopinath uh, teaches at Harvard. She's worked on emerging markets, uh, knows exactly what to do as a brilliant economist to fix India's economy. You know, I keep reading about fiscal cliff uh, in the U.S. and everybody worrying about it. I think we've gone over the fiscal cliff several times over the past three years and survived to tell the tale. Uh, Rahul Bajaj, uh, I will be, anything I say about him, I walk into dangerous territory. But all I can say is- Yeah, I'm a nice guy. Yes, Paul Bolke and Rahul Bajaj, one represents uh, you know, the leading power in Indian FMCG. 
to say that Rahul represents uh, a, le a leading power in Indian manufacturing will be an understatement because Rahul is, uh, he represents Indian manufacturing and business. Uh, I will not dare to call him a veteran, senior citizen, he'll kill me, right? Uh, but he's somebody, he's a remarkable Indian businessman. Uh, I learned early on in my life as a journalist that when you have limited space or time, find out the one interesting thing about somebody. The most interesting thing ab about him is that he's a businessman in India <coughs> who's always been willing to speak his mind. That's a rarity. When I see every year uh, Indian finance ministers present their budgets, and very often those are disastrous budgets, as we had last year. It was a terrible budget. And I see, on, again, on those same blue channels who hold panels like this, senior captains of Indian industry, and they ask him, what will you give the finance minister on 10? Everybody says, 8 on 10, 9 on 10. As they step off that panel of the camera, they say, mardia, rubbish, nonsense. But that is not Rahul. If Rahul thinks the budget sucks, he'll say 2 on 10. So that's why we have him here. Uh, I've done my bit of speaking. Uh, you All of you know the format. Each one of them gets about three minutes, three and a half minutes to make an opening, make his opening remarks, his or her opening remarks. And because, not because he's a minister, but because he's a new minister, Ashwini Kumar first. Well, thank you, um, Shekhar. Uh, let me first make two points which arise out of your introduction. It is true that Indian democracy needs to reboot its constitutional balance. When constitutions are written, they are intended to delineate and define as clearly as possible the unbroken power of the sovereign, namely the people. And that is precisely what our constitutional founders sought to do. It is true, and I agree with Shekhar, that over the last several years, somewhere there is a perception and a feeling that this constitutional balance needs again to be fine-tuned so as to live up to the aspirations of our founding fathers. The second point which I do wish to state is that we have consciously adopted the model of faster, inclusive, and sustainable growth. In fact, that's the title of the 12th five-year plan which we have only recently approved. We are aware of the fact that distributive equities and empowerment of groups that have lived on the margins for so long can only be achieved if we have faster growth and India certainly needs at least 9 to 10% growth in the not very distant future. It is equally true that we have had to revise our growth targets from 85 to 9% to now 5.5% this year, but we are confident that through a series of bold policy initiatives, transparency in governance, and regulatory reforms, we will be able to get back to about 8% by 2015, 2016. We are hoping to be able to achieve about 7% next year. But the overall average growth during the 12th five-year plan is estimated today by us to be in the region of 8.2% growth. It is certainly a good aspiration, certainly a tall aspiration, <coughs> considering the state of the global economy. But in the last few months, we have kick-started a series of important initiatives, which cumulatively and individually, we hope, will spur the investment climate in this country. There have been issues within the country of political nature. They all converge somewhere in the intersection between policy, law, and economic growth and social empowerment. How again to get the right balance in moving forward towards the achievement of all these aspirations is our challenge. We have accepted this challenge, and we shall continue to strive consistent with the constitutional promise of moving every Indian forward and giving better life to all our citizens 
in larger freedom. That, I believe, is the challenge, and we are determined to go ahead on that path. Thank you very much, Ashwini. That was very brief. Uh, Chandra, you have some ideas also. First of all, you can tell us what's gone wrong uh, as, as it affects you in, the, in your business and as you, see, as you see it, and if you, if you have any ideas on how to fix it. Thank you, Shekhar. Uh, I think before we talk about rebooting, as uh, Shekhar asked, it will be good to uh, think about what has gone wrong and uh, where are we, uh, where we are. Um, I think many things have gone wrong. I think we are in a situation where um, uh, inflation is high. There's no growth. Growth has really come down very, very significantly. We have been only revising the growth rate downwards. And fiscal deficits are high. And we keep taking measures. Um, we keep having very high in interest rates, thinking that that will bring down inflation but that is not happening. So none of uh, anything that is being done seems to be working. But why did we get here? We got here because we didn't do many things right. We, from a global investor point of view, Indian entrepreneur point of view, uh, there is no confidence. I think in business, if you are running a company, we always ask, why would a customer do business with us? We will all come up with many answers. People will ask, what is your value proposition? Why does a particular customer work with you? We'll say we have capability, we have great talent, we have um, a, a global footprint, we have uh, a track record. We'll say a lot of things. And then someone would ask, OK, how is it different from somebody else? And you can keep on introspecting. But to me, fundamentally, the two words are very important, comfort confidence. At the end of the day, whoever has to do business with you, they have to have comfort. And they have to have the confidence that whatever is the belief with which they work with you, and you will always deliver on that belief. Some is ex explicit, some is implicit. So the confidence and comfort can come only by track record, in other words, by execution. Here the problem here is in India, Execution is our problem. And it is not that we don't execute all the time. We have a lot of good examples. You take the Delhi Metro, you have the Konkan Railway, you have the Delhi Airport, if it's the infrastructure project. There are good examples of execution. But many times, uh, there is a problem of comfort and, and confidence. And we go and take a retrograde step, reverse something. Then that belief is gone. So when the belief is gone, the comfort is gone. Comfort and confidence once is eroded, it takes a long time to get it back. Whereas to gain, you have to work hard. To lose, it's pretty easy. So anything that we do, we just have to make sure that it is centered around comfort and confidence. So I think fundamentally to me, the most important recommendation I would give is execution. So how do, we, how do you do that? Let's say we, we want to do 10 things, whether it is policy or whether it is projects doesn't matter. If you say FDA in retail, if you say FDA in insurance, FDA in airlines, whatever it is, there has to be a follow-through plan on execution. And in the last couple of months, a number of steps have been announced by the government. There's a positive momentum again. But if you want to pick up that positive momentum and then make a big deal out of it, it's important to execute. And there has to be a definitive timeline. Similarly, if you take 10 projects, Let's name 10 projects and let's give it complete visibility and then have very, very definitive timelines on how they will get execute, executed. And let's also make showcase out of successes. If we want to prove that in this area we can do well, then let's really work with whoever wants to invest. Let's work with them to make sure that make sure that, that, that really gets the right kind of attention. But the problem here is Everyone is scared because the government works with somebody, then there will be a couple of other people who will say there is something wrong. That's why the government is working with somebody. And there's a, there's a constant um, situation where everyone is trying to take mileage out of anything that can be projected as negative. 
so the government is also sometimes in a fix because even to do the right thing they have to be so much extra careful because there are enough people who raise an issue it's not only other political parties sometimes the media and you watch the tv channels on every small thing there is a huge discussion and the level of discussion that goes on sometimes is repeated one zillion times you think that it really hap happens one zillion so one zillion times maybe it has happened once or has not happened or it's being questioned so i think there is a collective responsibility it's not only the government i think if we have to execute government alone cannot do it government businesses other political parties uh, media all stakeholders have to come together but it's very important for india i think we can execute it's a country which has got lot of sporadic successes and yes i am very disappointed that we are we are here like you said talking about how do we move up from five and a half because no one ever thought in even all our travels when people ask how do you see india we will uh, probably grow 8 to 10% and i won't be surprised if we grow 12% when you look at the next 20 years this is the kind of dialogue this is what we will uh, talk to all the executives we see whether it's in latin america or us or any other part of the world but instead we are here talking about moving up from 5.5% to 7.5% 8% etc which is great which is a good number compared to every other market every other country but if you ask what is the potential our potential is much much higher and it it will happen it can go up the way it dropped from 8 to 5 and a half it can easily go up provided we can collectively take that as a single agenda growth 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 that's an agenda and we have to come together to execute and we have to follow some rules of the game uh, all stakeholders without which uh, there is there is a comfort and confidence issue which we will overcome but will take a long time to overcome Mr. Ashwini Kumar, uh, he talked about comfort and con confidence. There is a third element, which is optimism. Uh, has your government really messed things up, so the optimism is lost, or have we Indians collectively messed things up? I mean, media included. Well, I, I don't think. When, when, I, when I see media, uh, TV news channels, which where background music is is now the new normal, and there is ticker tape and drum roll, right, and everything is called huge. massive or fierce and now lately times now says biggest fiercest most serious most severe so uh, so all of us have contributed to this but where have we lost our optimism and can we get it back why well, you ask me considering that you have a prime minister who never smiles well well you ask me whether government has messed things up i don't think any government is its own enemy at least that benefit of doubt you must give to the government but it is equally true that in a democracy governments are impacted in their functioning by perceptions that are created by actors outside of the government i certainly don't want to deny to media its rightful role in informing the people on issues the people ought to be informed and also i don't deny to media its right to criticize but quite clearly it is for the country as a whole to take the country forward together and that is the point i sought to make when i talked about the constitutional balance and i'm also again reiterating it in the context of this question that the obligations of different sections of society in a country have to be worked out together and have to be performed in tandem you can't have one branch of governance working all the time at cross purposes in a negative environment and what's that one branch one branch of government could be is this the, a, it is, could is this be your environment could, ministry or is it uh, no i will i will not i will not single out a ministry is concerned i think the ministries in keeping with the concept of collective responsibility ought to work together and not at cross purposes i will not attribute blame to one or the other ministry because i am as much a captive to the discipline of collective responsibility but it is true that the prime minister has clearly indicated that governments ought to speak in one voice when it comes to but did we get the sense priorities. did we get the sense and were we right in getting that sense that the center of gravity of this government had weakened has weakened i'm not saying it's been fixed yet 
Well, uh, I'm glad you reminded me of this. You spoke about an autoimmune disease uh, in your introductory remarks, and you hinted at a government party disconnect. I, I would like to dispute that proposition, and that has been validated. As of last Sunday. As a, that has been validated recently by the fulsome support of the Congress party to the government in pursuing and carrying forward the economic reform agenda. The series of initiatives, and I did not recount because I was waiting uh, to do so in an interactive session, that have now been unfolded demonstrate beyond doubt the collective and purposive res resolve of the government to move ahead to do what is right by the nation, to do what is right for the people of India, irrespective of prophets of doom, and the most formidable ones are amongst the media who would always say breaking news. You talked of some channels, I won't name them, but breaking news only means negative news. Negative for the sake of hogging l headlines. We all know, and nobody knows that better than you, Shekhar, that the easiest way to be on the front pages of newspapers and on prime time is to say something contrarian, a task, a role which Rahul has perfected, and that is why he rightly gets the, the limelight. Well, I think uh, when I look at the, <laughs> I, lo I, I look at the faces uh, uh, in this audience, and I, I see most of most of you know more about Indian politics than I even pretend to know. So, uh, so I don't have to explain everything he said, but what he meant for those of you who come from outside, he was referring to a big public rally that was held uh, last Sunday in Delhi, one of the biggest rallies in Delhi for a long time, more than 100,000 people. Uh, I mean, they have different yeah. theories on how they were brought or how they came in, <laughs> but it was more than, more than 100,000 people, but importantly, it was the first time that leadership of the Congress party came out to support foreign investment in anything. In fact, it was the first time in our history of 65 years that Congress party came out in support of anything foreign after uh, PLO and ANC and Gorbachev. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a statement of fact. Uh, 1991. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. 1991. Yes. Nin uh, it wasn't the first time. The economic reform process and the opening of the economy to foreign investment the process no, no, no. started uh, in no, no. 1991. But, 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 but to come out in support of economic reform in public has never happened. When Narsimha Rao brought about, I mean, I'm sorry to be arguing with you, not my, my job is to get them to argue with each other. Uh, but when Narsimha Rao reformed, your party's leadership was in hibernation, right? And they buried him. When he died, his body came to your party headquarters. The truck bearing his body was not allowed to enter your party headquarters. His body was sent back. We have so not that's buried not the reforms. So, uh, Whatever it is. But, but it was a big change. You know, this Sunday marks a turning point, I think, in the history of uh, Congress Party and India's reform and the process of rebooting India. That I have to acknowledge and all of us have to acknowledge. And nobody has seen this more closely than Paul Bolke, who was a brave foreign investor, uh, runs Nestle, one of the most successful companies uh, in India. And Am I right in saying that your, your business is more or less protected from uh, what goes on behind the scenes? No, I, <laughs> that would be easy. Um, uh, but look, uh, we have been here for a long time, so um, uh, and, and we, do, we do have confidence in, 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 in the country because of its sheer potential. But if you go back to the title, this reboot, uh, uh, when you speak about reboot, that means your computer has crashed and, and, and nothing is possible anymore. You have to you have to take a plug it out and wait for a moment. And I don't think uh, India has to reboot. I mean, uh, maybe some parts of, of, of the society has to really put back and, 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 and redo things. But uh, you see, uh, it's the 27th forum in India now. And, and the first forum was speaking about opening up. Uh, and, and, and then the last year in Mumbai, we, we were speaking about uh, uh, linking uh, leadership with livelihood, I think it was. And, and it was talking about uh, how we have to go for growth and, and let the forces work and, and, and do inclusive growth. And, and, and all of a sudden, now we speak about reboot again. So um, what I do feel is the title is good. Uh, uh, the, the subject of deliberation, from deliberation to, to really uh, transformation, which is, in other words, start doing things. Uh, a lot of talking. A lot, we have to start doing things. It looks to me, and having been part, Nestle, of, of India for so many years, it looks to me that that India is suffering from its own gravity. 
Let me explain that. Um, the gravity of its uh, so rich past and, and the gravity of its, its history, and that in an interconnected world where the world is moving very, very, very fast. So that's a, a gravity that is conditioning what we do today. Also, gravity of its size. You see, the sheer size of India is, is, is actually an opportunity, yet at the same time as a liability, if you uh, allow then the complexity to come in. And, and if you see the complexity, I see the, um, a society is like a painting, uh, where, where actually government should do the framing, and then you, you let civil society, entrepreneurs, uh, all partners and players and uh, all stakeholders uh, fill the painting. The problem is when government starts to do too much of a framing, there's no space less, less, uh, left for, for the painting. And that's one of the biggest problems in my eyes, as, as, as there's so much regulations, there's so much complexity, there's so much that kills a little bit the entrepreneurial spirit that you do have in this country. It has proven over and over again. If I may interrupt you, uh, you've been doing business here. What has changed for the worse over the past couple of years that we need to reboot now? Is it just the mood? Is it more than that? Well, definitely the mood. If you see, if you have a title like Reboot and all, that's not very positive in the mood. Um, um, that's a reflection of what is felt. There's a little bit of, you have also, not that the facts are different, it's a little bit the, you had this um, from, uh, from aspiration, that was we aspire uh, to, to, to really to expectation. Expectation is another attitude. That's where you start saying, it's not anymore up to me now. Uh, we have to expect a little bit, and that's what's, what I feel has happened. Uh, there was a good, when you have 10% growth and all, you have a good, it, 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 it frames itself and it, it, it creates its own momentum. What didn't happen is, uh, and it, it, that came in spite of not doing the, the, the reforms that everybody is talking about. Everybody, if I listen to, uh, to, to the people here, everybody knows what has to be done. It is just that getting it done and, and, and having, I would say, the, the, well, the trust, the autoconfidence to do it, uh, that, that is somewhere lacking, to have, to have the guts to, to go for more simpler systems, to go for simplicity and transparency. Um, so uh, the, the, it's always the same thing, a journey, you only do a journey when you start walking and, and, and dare to do that, uh, move for action. And that is what the title is all about. Ita, uh I think three of the panelists have talked percentages, uh, mainly growth, but I'll tell you something about uh, our country. I, I mostly write facetious stuff. So one of the most facetious things I've been saying over the past many years, that in India, we can deal with anything, calamity, war, famine, anything, but we cannot deal with some percentages. One is 10% inflation. Second is rupee going to 50 to a dollar. And third is 10% growth. We are also afraid of, we always say 9% growth. A finance minister, prime minister, everybody says we have to achieve 9% growth. For some reason, we have the fear of 10% growth. In the past 12 months, we've conquered two of these fears. Rupee has gone to 54 as we stand today. And we've tasted double digit inflation. So what is it uh, that makes us so fearful, that should make a country or a society or a democracy so fearful of faster growth, of higher growth. There is phobia in this country. You even find uh, uh, news anchors on stock market channels talking 9% growth. Uh, I've not been able to crack this. Uh, and you are a macroeconomist. I mean, what consequences do you see if, if India were to go to that path? How can India go to that path? Can India balance growth, equity, inflation? Uh, the argument that goes on all, all the time, in fact, right now, one of the disconnects in Indian economic management is the Monetary Authority, the Reserve Bank of India, and the Fiscal Authority, which is the Ministry of Finance. So, uh, in fact, uh, I think everybody will be happy if, you, if I take two minutes from Rahul and give them to you additionally. Rahul, one minute for you after that. Thanks. Uh, I mean, I don't think that the concern right now is about whether India will grow at 9% or grow at 10%, or whether we can, we can accept that we can grow at 10%. Uh, I think it, I agree with you that it's, it's remarkable that we are sitting here at this forum and talking about rebooting India. And, and I think it's remarkable not because India got used to growing at high rates for a very long period of time. On the contrary, it's actually surprising how short it is, how quickly we've come to this point uh, where we have to start talking about rebooting India. So 
And I don't think this is a matter of perceptions. I, I mean, I, the panelists have brought up issues about perceptions and marketing. I mean, I don't think it's about perceptions of marketing. I think this is about fundamentals. It's no mystery why growth has slowed down. Uh, for a country at, its, at this stage of development, in, uh, given India's economic institutions, given its political institutions, this is not a country that can afford to undertake reforms every 30 years. You cannot have reforms in 1990, 1991, and then again revisited on a serious basis 30 years later. You have to, take, you have to un undertake consistent reforms. So for instance, if you look at the World Bank's ease of, business, of doing business uh, report, India ranks 132 out of 183 countries. That's a very poor ranking for where India is, despite having grown over so many it's years. It's comparable with our ranking on Human Development Index. It's bad. And, and if you look at specific measures in that, so for instance, I can bring this up because the Minister of Law is here. If you talk about enforcement of contracts, India ranks 182 out of 183, which is pretty much at the bottom, correct? And so if you look back and you think what reforms were undertaken, you we actually We have the Minister that. of Law nodding. Yes. yes. And so you actually, if you look at the reforms that have been undertaken over the last four years, you can count them, and it's a very precise zero. So if you go into another measure, which is dealing with construction permits, India ranks 181 out of 183. How many reforms got undertaken over the last four years? Again, another precise zero. So I think the fact that India has slowed down is actually not a mystery. It's not mysterious at all that India has slowed down. I think it's because reforms have been taken, have taken place on a very spasmic basis. It happens only when you think that your ratings are going to be downgraded, um, and that doesn't work. So the question is why? Why haven't reforms happened on a more consistent basis? And I think part of the reason for it is that the consensus for reform doesn't exist. I don't think that society as a whole here has accepted that the reforms that being, uh, are being undertaken are actually benefiting all parts of society. And there is some truth to it. While India has grown uh, and poverty levels have come down and people have benefited, for each percent increase in growth, the amount of percent reduction in poverty has been much lower in India uh, as compared to, say, South Korea, when South Korea was growing, or more recently, if you compare it to China. The question is, why is that? How do we solve that? How do we make sure that growth benefits everybody, and then there will be a greater consensus for reform across political uh, parties? And in my opinion, the one sector that needs to be fixed is manufacturing. There is no way that India can transition from being a low, from low income country to middle income country without having a healthy manufacturing sector given the size of the labor force that exists. And so that has to be dealt with, I mean, you cannot skip from agriculture to services and ignore manufacturing. And there are many reasons why manufacturing is weak, it's 16% of GDP. Uh, if you want to hire all the unskilled labor that exists, you need to give a manufacturing a boost. Now, the variables that have been mentioned numerous number of times is infrastructure. The one that I'm going to put out there is labor markets. Labor markets in India are extremely rigid. And in fact, we've had policy changes that happened in 1982 with Industrial Disputes Act, which basically made it hard to fire anybody if you had more than 100 workers. So maybe the kinds of reforms that need to be undertaken are reforms of the following kind that say, OK, we need to reboot manufacturing. Maybe what we need to do is reverse this particular change we had in 1982 and go back to the Industrial Disputes Act of 1947 that didn't have this kind of unreasonable uh, 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 policy measure in there. So unless growth becomes, uh, goes down to a larger fraction of, uh, of people in this country, as long as there's no deeper consensus for reform, as long as India understands that reforms have to, un have to take place every year on a consistent basis and not every 30 years, and that it has to be implemented. I would not be surprised if we are back here again in a few years talking about rebooting India. I think uh, I mean, the point with which I particularly have, uh, have uh, sympathy is that uh, Indian political class has not done enough to sell the idea of reform to people by and large. I think it's by and large the message is, uh, you know, we have to reform, but we'll also look after you, as if there is a contradiction between the, future, between the fate of the poor and the reform. 
and it, it's it's a tough it, it, and their job is not easy indian politicians job because india has had sort of six decades of uh, socialist uh, toxification uh, i once had a conversation with mr narsimha rao after it ceased to be prime minister politicians have a lot more time for you and they really love you if you meet them when they've lost power uh, so he was a very wise man i used to see i used to go see him and spend a lot of time with him <laughs> and i asked him i would keep on asking him how did you make this u turn on india's economy so he said no 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 in india you can be you can never be seen to be making a u turn so i said so how does narsimha rao make a u turn without anybody figuring out that he's making a u turn so he smiled one of his rare mischievous smiles and he said suppose the ground under you is moving so so you need politicians of great skills in this country to uh, to bring about this change without jerking the system because people then start responding and people who get left out because you know uh, a rising tide lifts all boats but it doesn't lift all boats uniformly at the same time it lifts the yachts first and then the others see those boats going up and say what the hell is going on so there is a problem uh, and she's underlined the problem uh, very well i see uh, sadguru very amused by this uh rahul she's done half the job for you i mean uh, she's also told told you what your responsibility is if india has to reboot it needs to fix its manufacturing which basically means you have to fix bajaj auto right so <laughs> so if you, no, you didn't uh, only give her my time whatever it was but no, you can uh, take the rest she of took mine. away my content <laughs> you are right <laughs> and most of what she said i fully agree you didn't agree go to with. harvard so uh, you didn't go to harvard no No, I went uh, the other side of Charles River, which is not intellectual. That's I Harvard know, Business I School. Know. This is the intellectual part Absolutely. of uh, Harvard. So, uh, <laughs> so while you talk, they don't make money. I make money. That's the difference. While you talk, <laughs> they spend it. So while you talk manufacturing and the rest, Rahul also, uh, and let's be serious, you and I. It's tough for us to be serious. Uh, <laughs> let's also talk about how to bring back this optimism. You know, we are becoming <laughs> Indians in this audience will know it. you know i call ourselves now the meena kumari society now meena kumari was called the tragedy queen of indian cinema in the 60s if you went to see a meena kumari film my mom would say take two handkerchiefs you know her face appeared on the screen and the whole country would start crying sometimes i say our prime minister looks like that <laughs> lately i mean last 3 weeks has begun to smile right is no longer meena kumari so how do we how do we get ourselves out of this meena kumari mindset and get some optimism back The kind of things you have been saying, Shekhar. I better make clear to those who don't know me that I'm a very, very proud Indian, and I have a very positive and optimistic view of where India will be, in spite of all that's happening for the next, uh, the next five, ten, fifteen years. Amongst other reasons, the main one major reason is we have skilled and motivated workers, entrepreneurs, farmers who are raring to go. Then where are we, and why are we here? What uh, Ms. Gopinath mentioned. I don't want to blame democracy because I don't want a government other than democratic. I, that's the best system we can have, as Winston Churchill said. But he did say it's a terrible form of government, and we have been seeing this for the last so many years in India. Political expediency rather than what's good for India. We have a fiscal deficit. We have a current account deficit. We have weak governance. We have inflation. consequences are inadequate infrastructure a high rate of interest low rate of gdp in addition to that why is the domestic and foreign investment desires weak in addition to all this because of a land acquisition policy and i have no time to go into details we have to take care of the farmer if somebody comes to take my land if the government comes to take my land i will fight to the last breath but that doesn't mean there should be no growth environment uh it's not a question of the present or the past minister of environment and the law minister rightly said he don't want to talk of ministry but again i want my children and grandchildren to have a clean environment then go back to the cave age our pri former prime minister indira gandhi said the biggest polluter is poverty go back to the cave age we have to have balanced growth sustainable growth nothing is moving there are no clearances no investments are being made you need very correct industrial jobs good industrial jobs in the organized sector that's where we pay well that's where the working conditions are good and why labor legislation 
No political party. That's one reform no political party is willing to do. They don't have the guts to do it. To protect 8 million people in the organized sector. You are hurting not only the farmers, so many unorganized people, they get minimum wages, 3,000, 4,000 rupees a month, and terrible working conditions. You free it, free it for five years, Mr. Minister, and see what happens. Just let us, yes, there is no safety net, I have no time to go into that, so there is no safety net. Whichever industry or company wants to reduce its workforce, it should provide a safety net. I won't go into details what kind of safety net. That is a requirement in a country like India. So we need the goods and services tax. We need a proper direct tax code. I mean, today, if we don't move ahead, if we don't have the right sentiment, apart from the various things we need, uh, whether it's a good services tax, and, and there's a whole list. The problem is how to get it done. Even FDI in retail, it doesn't require parliamentary approval. But those states who will not do it, out. And if someone like the West Bengal Chief Minister brings in some resolution on FDI retail to show that the majority of the lower house of parliament is against it, and if that succeeds, legally it may not be binding, but I don't know how the government can move ahead. And there's the company's bill, there's a pension bill, there's an insurance bill. The left will oppose it. I can understand that. That's an ideological situation. When I was in the upper house of parliament, they were all sitting next to me and we became friendly, though we don't, don't agree with each other on these issues. But the BJP, and I have very good friends in the Congress, present company not excluded, and I have very good friends in the BJP. They agree on economic matters, and I've said it on TV channels so many times. Mostly they agree on economic matters. They may have some other disagreements. But no, it's political opportunism. And whenever I talk to a cabinet minister in the government, the BJP did this, BJP did this, BJP didn't cooperate. And you get convinced. And then you talk to the BJP guys. And they say the same thing. Now it's not for me or anyone else to say who's wrong, who's right. The winter session is coming now, Shekhar, from 21st of November for a month. I don't think it will be completely destroyed like two other sessions earlier. I don't think BJP can afford to do that. I don't know what your views are. But how will it, what will it be done? I mean, there are so many parties, each will disrupt it for its own reasons for a couple of hours, half day gone. I used to see that when I was there. And without BJCP support, nothing can get passed in the Raj Sabha because the left and others will oppose it anyway, even perhaps the Samajwadi Party and Mayawati support, who may not support FDI and retail. So how do we move ahead? It's opportunism. And as I said, it's not for me to blame anybody. Uh, so I think the political climate is bad, and what doesn't give me hope is the parliamentary elections, which I do, you know, we have two state elections, one has just finished, one will finish uh, in December, the results will be out on 20th of December, there will be eight more elections in 2013, but the major, the mother of all elections, the parliament elections, this latest is May 2014, there are people talking it could be after the budget next year, I don't know where, that's not my job, but I don't see hope there too. Everybody says, which government will form the government? So we are not getting into that. We are saying, we are paying a price for democracy. This is not an excuse. Because I don't want any other system other than democracy. And it is the responsibility and the obligation of every citizen of India to see that it functions well. To elect, not criminals, to elect people not on the basis of caste and color and on money power. To elect the right people. Now, how, do it, how does it get done? I mean, I have no answers. Uh, Shekhar and uh, uh, the minister will know much better than me. But I am, as a very proud Indian, a very unhappy Indian today. And I don't think anybody is afraid of 10% growth. Uh, uh, Shekhar is very difficult to disagree with him. It's, we love 10% growth. We need, with a $1,500 per capita income and $40,000 in the developed world like United States, it's no consolation. Somebody says, we are 5.5% this year. Uh, they are 0, 1, half. We need 10. There's tremendous inequality in our country. There's tremendous poverty in our country. Unless we grow at 10, people are afraid to say that because it's not easy. There are various economic calculations, which the person on my left will know much better than me, without which savings rate, this rate, that rate, you cannot reach 10. So they don't want to talk about it. And that's all right.
It's not that they are afraid, okay, it's a little inflationary or what? What will we do with a lot of money coming in? I'm not worried. We want 10%. I say it openly. And I think the people of India will support me in saying we want 10%, but follow the right policies. Get these guys, politicians, working together. And uh, I think I'll stop there. I, the problem is, uh, Rahul, if I may uh, add to what you're saying, is that in our politics today, we won, there is an intellectual deficit on all sides. And there is also a leadership deficit. Now, on the Congress side, the leadership deficit was a disconnect between the party and the government. They have tried to fix it over the past two weeks. In the BJP, there is genuinely a leadership deficit. So nobody's, talking, nobody's even thinking of what they can afford and what they cannot afford. I don't think they could afford to, uh, to destroy the last two sessions of parliament as well, but because they didn't have any other ideas, they've done so now. Uh, uh, but I suppose politics has its own process of self-correction, uh, and we'll see some of that. Now, uh, we have about 50 minutes left, 14 in fact. So if I could see people raising their hands. And you know the system, uh, somebody will bring a microphone to you. Please introduce yourself and ask one sharp question. And if you could also say, who do you want this answer by? Uh, I'm Amit from the Institute for Competitiveness. My question is, uh, it seems that the government and the politics have actually become the poster boy of hitting. We are not really talking about inclusive growth and we are not really talking about the role that the businessmen sitting in this room have to take and how they really need to reconstruct the business models because that's where growth is going to happen. And my question is to Mr. Kumar, please. Come again, you said there was a, we need a business model, I'm sorry? We need a business model or a newer business model from the corporates here to really talk about inclusive growth, to talk about growth in this country. We should not really talk about hitting the government all the time. Shekhar has been actually talking about that or saying that everything's wrong with policy, everything's wrong with government. There's a lot which is wrong with the business as well. And we need to talk about that as well. Well, um, let me just answer by saying, um, by invoking the well-known example of Bajaj Auto. I think what I'm going to say will answer both Rahul Bajaj and you. Yes, there are no perfect situations and there are no perfect solutions. Yes, Shekhar, democracy and transition are interrelated in terms of space, time, and speed. And that is how it is, not only in India, all over the world. But if we were doing everything that was wrong, in terms of policies, in terms of implementation thereof, in terms of execution. How is it that Bajaj Auto is one of the most successful companies over the last years, recording the highest levels of profits, and today a main source of income of Bajaj Auto is, uh, is with their financial management, made possible by the vast accumulation of wealth from their businesses? How is it that despite everything that some people suggest has gone wrong in this country, and Nothing seems to be going right in this country. How is it that we have achieved about 8.2% oh, growth? Ashwini, I think, I think his question is... No, uh, I'm, not, I'm coming to the question, but I have to answer this. A number of things have been made. Assumptions are wrong. The assumption that we are not, and that was your assumption, that we are not getting used to uh, high growth, and why are we so cautious about 10% and all? I think it's the wrong assumption. The very fact that we are discussing the rebooting of India's economy at 5.5 and the rest of the world is going at 3.2 shows that we have got accustomed to high growth and that is how it should be. And we are going to proceed to that high growth level. I agree that there has to be also the rebooting of the business models, etc., etc. That is for the entrepreneurs to do. That is for corporate India to do. So do we, we expect the New Companies Act in this par parliament session? Well, we hope, and that, is, that brings me to your point. Because corporate, go Transition. corporate governance is also an issue in India. Yes, it is. And I readily accept that corporate governance is a primary issue. For example, it was suggested to me, and I don't know, I say so subject to correction, it was suggested to me that there is, amongst others, a few, th a few um, uh, changes are in, the, are, are, are in the works that suggest that if there is an allegation of wrongdoing, um, X, Y, Z could would be disentitled to be on the board. I, I don't. I hope it doesn't happen because it should be wrong. What I'm trying to say, Sheikh, and you'll permit me one and a half minutes because I've had to answer two or three propositions. It was suggested by Gita that contracts are not being enforced. I'm sorry. There's not been a single case before these three or four cases that have now come up and which are being now fought under BIPA where India has ever reneged on its international commercial um, uh, contractual obligations. Never. 
It is true that our system of justice delivery but that is the problem. Is, is, is difficult. Delays is the it problem. is true that we take time. We are trying to fix that. And I would like to take this opportunity to state that we are putting together a new legal regime specifically catering to conflicts arising out of international contracts and investment. Ashwini, I have to move to the question. I think we just have time for two or three now. Wonderful panel. Thank you. Amit Kinodia from Boston. The question is for the panel. Anybody can take it. Rahul. Shekhar, Mr. Minister Kumar, when can we see more trust being built between the populations and the government when government speaks, we take it to heart that they're telling the truth, whether it's investors or it's a civilian population? Thank you. I think uh, uh, I can, uh, if I can make a ch choice, I'll ask Chandra, because Chandra, you, you come from a more civilized part of the country, <laughs> which, which is which is less, less political in its day-to-day -day life. No, I think it's a I question mean, when of... When do you start uh, trusting the government uh, when government speaks, and what can the government do to become more trustworthy? I think just not the government alone. We've got to trust the system. By system, by system I mean all stakeholders are part of the system. I think the only way to do it is just make commitments and keep honoring them in a very timely fashion. Uh, say what you will do and then do them. Because just because good things happen, uh, people will not uh, s start building confidence. I think you just have to make commitments and then just, just keep delivering. That's the only way to do it. Track record. Rahul can't be left out of this. No, I would only want to uh, mention this, uh, uh, Shekhar, that without going to details, the new companies will, will come, it must come. Corporate governance is necessary. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, we should not go overboard, even like Sabah and Oxley in the United States. We are way behind them in size, etc., etc. We should not try to tie the hands of the corporates. But that apart, we all know there are two ways of doing business anywhere in the world. A business based on market and a business based on crony capitalism. That's what has to be taken care of. That doesn't require a law. The law is there. Don't corrupt, don't cheat. But we have crony capitalists. And we have politicians who encourage crony capitalists, and money changes hands, and that has to stop. And to uh, the kind words said by Ashwini ji to, uh, regarding Bajaj Auto, yes, I'm very proud to be chairman of Bajaj Auto, and we really own that public company largely. It's done exceptionally well, if I may say so, and this is not a commercial in the last 30 years. The growth, 20 times growth, 30 times exports, one of the most profitable companies in India, but why? One, a little lightheartedly, in spite of the government. He kept saying that. But yes, in spite of the government, not because of the government. And second is a major issue. We decided many years ago, decades ago, we will not do business where we have to deal with the government, except to the extent of the laws of the land. We don't manufacture a thing which the government has to buy. We don't sell. Uh, we don't uh, buy things from the government. We make motorcycles, we are in financial services, we are not dependent on the government. The moment you want to bid for a subway contract or a bridge and get an order from the government and many other things or get a coal mine, oh, oh, how do you get it? We don't get into that. Even a power project, we, just, we have got so much surplus cash, everybody says, why don't you do this? We said, no, I want to sleep well. Touch wood, we are doing very well. But that is because we have stayed away, Ashwini, from the kind I of see. businesses but which require... I see, I, I, I see, I see, Ashwini nodded is, furiously. No, I'm sorry. I think, I, I think, mean, uh, this, Ashwini, Ashwini, Ashwini. No, I think I, no, just one this, this justifies it lunch. No, no, does Mr. Bajaj wish this audience to believe that Bajaj Auto or his company works outside the labor this is not a, of this This country? is not a parallel Bajaj Auto. Does it work Auto. outside the manufacturing Ashwini. policy of this country? Does he work outside the fiscal policies I, of this country? Where's the red card? I, I mean, this is saying too much. Into a debate. I mean, just no, no, because you don't it. deal with the government I, I will, doesn't I will, mean I will, I will, work outside the laws of this country. Let me explain that. I will red card both of you and all arguments will be expunged using the privilege of the speaker. No, no. I think this is an argument that should go on. But I think it's good that everybody is speaking candidly. It's a good idea that people should speak candidly. And, and since you spoke candidly, I'll also speak candidly, that you worry about crony capitalism. I today uh, worry about crony journalism. Absolutely. Right? You know, uh, 
at Great my news. at 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 at, at my at, 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 at my at my still rather young age i am the <laughs> oldest serving editor of a broadsheet in the country <laughs> and i feel like the dean of the editorial faculty and one day, and this is not a discussion on chronic journalism but if you had one i'd rather be sitting there so there are problems because too many people have become too rich too soon and too many people uh, have become too rich too soon through sort of dodgy uh, economic activity that is mainly uh, making money off resources and that's created uh, an imbalance uh, it's also given economic growth a bad name because a lot of the ordinary honest indians now think oh economic reform means somebody who was my neighbor has done nothing but collected land bank has now got a private plane so those are issues that need to be addressed uh, and and i think two of you need to have a meeting of your own hi uh, my name is uh, tathagat bhattacharya i work with the network 18 group and uh, this question is uh, specifically for mr kumar and uh, mr bajaj that is uh, uh, one one uh, of the two okay or, 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 okay or tv 18 you ask them for a panel discussion <laughs> and call arnab goswami as your anchor <laughs> yeah Who's a the, good friend of mine by the way yeah. mine too yes yeah uh, the thing is that uh, uh, assuming that uh, people are finally waking up to what is to be done and that issues uh, relating to labor market reforms and other uh, i mean pro growth measures are going to be taken in the parliament i would like to know what is the industry and the policy makers kind of take on kind of corporate loan write offs because uh, two years back i mean the corporate loan write offs and bad debt i think I, was we, almost we, to the tune of 100 billion dollars we, 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 we get your point but uh, i mean if i may i may guillotine it i am not sure a minister is authorized to speak on corporate loan write offs aren't the banks supposed to be uh, autonomous ashwini of course yeah i mean that's their decision i mean i don't i don't think there could be any policy a uh, blanket policy on corporate loan write offs i mean that will be uh, farmers I, loan I, write offs i'm, I'm not aware of corporates that. don't have votes i i'm not i'm not aware whether there is such a policy in the works uh, but the last I question in the that, yes i fully agree for a change i must agree with the minister there is no policy like that but there is a lot of criticism apart from loan waivers for the farmers that we understand why that is there right or wrong but billions of dollars of loans have been written off or they have become bad debts with the big corporates not due to the policy of the government but loans have been given for wrong reasons to the wrong companies today there are 10 companies big huge companies at least 10 who are so leveraged they can't survive i can't that, take those names but here that that question the bank management should answer not the government bank management answer and some of them some of them say we have under pressure to give a loan not to write off the loan but to give a loan and that creates from absolutely the last that's question that's an executive decision not okay. a policy uh, decision geeta I mean, let's be clear some of these banks are state banks this is the state bank of all india all of them so most of them the most fact them. that the government Especially can write its debt. hands off of it seems yeah. a bit extreme uh, and and they all have phone connections The last question. My name is Sir Kumar. Both function that way. K S Kumar. Just said one. We had a lot of discussions about the problem statements. You know of what exactly uh, are the challenges one sharp that we have. Question, question to Geeta. At the macroeconomic level, if something were to change fundamentally in the structure, what needs to change to make this difference and make things happen? Well, I think uh, this is what I brought up earlier, which is that I think growth is important, but I think. reforms have to be sold from the perspective that it's going to help everybody in this in the in the country and the one sector that doesn't get that much attention is manufacturing and industry i think those sectors have to be revitalized uh by doing that you will move unskilled workers out of low paying jobs into more productive work where they get higher wages and they're going to have a higher livelihood instead the approach that's being taken now is to undertake reform that's growth enhancing and that's fine but then to help people at the lower end of the spectrum you make transfers through narega or through food subsidies and what that does is basically blow a hole through the fiscal deficit so that's not the way to help people at the bottom of the of the pyramid the way to help people at the lower levels of income is to give them better working opportunities and if if growth is undertaken with that perspective in mind i think that's crucial the second structural change that of course is required is where this is more a macro perspective is where both fiscal policy and monetary policy work together to address the high demand situation in the economy 
It's not enough for monetary policy just to be raising interest rates or for keeping interest rates high to bring demand down. You need to have fiscal policy also dealing with that directly, which has not happened. And unfortunately, India has had a history of fiscal indiscipline. So this is not specific to this particular government. It goes back a long time. And that's another structural problem that needs to be addressed. Well, thank you, Geeta. Uh, I think the essence of this, uh, since my vantage point is politics uh, all the time, I think the essential thing that, thing that needs to change in India is that politicians have to start convincing the population by and large that reform is good for all of them or most of them. I think in the past uh, we've had discourse like reform is inevitable, we can't escape it, so we must prepare to deal with it. And I sometimes say it's a bit like saying it's inevitable that I'll be sentenced to 10 years in prison, so I might as well go and improve, improve conditions in my jails. Right? Uh, the politician has to change the discourse in the country, to go and tell people reform is good for you and you will grow because of reform, but not in spite of reform. It's not easy to do because you know, politics is a very heavy uh, business, as uh, Paul Bolke said. When you have a large size, it also gives you momentum and inertia. You have to deal with it. So that's a challenge. Uh, and in, as India starts rebooting itself, we've had a wonderful discussion. Thank you very much, all the panelists. Uh, I think uh, when you hold a vote at the end of the day, uh, at the end of this conference, uh, this session will get the highest TRP ratings and it'll have nothing to do with me. So thank you all. You've all been wonderful panelists. And one more reform, if I may, su if I may suggest. You know, while uh, India reforms its economy, uh, if, if WEF could tell the Leela or whoever, whoever has done the lighting to improve the lighting because it's in my eyes and I can't see the audience. So if I've missed out any hands in the back, my apologies to them. I've got my alibi, it's the lights. So next day when I come with sort of better positioned lights, <coughs> I'll be able to see you. Thank you very much.